Hey, everybody. It is Tuesday, February 6th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Shwanunu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Jill, admittedly, uh, we taped early on Sunday before the Grammys. So (laughs) we haven't gotten a chance to chat about them yet on the pod. Uh, forgive us, and you can forward this about 90 seconds to two minutes if you know <laughs> those of you are like, I don't need to hear about the Grammys. It's Tuesday, guys. Yes, this isn't Groundhog Day. We, yes. <laughs> we're one day late to the game. <laughs> but Moshe, I thought it was one of the best Grammys I've seen in a really long time. Yeah, uh, and apparently America responded. Uh, we'll have numbers later in the podcast on how many people actually watch a show live in 2024, a rarity, uh, and something – TV has been struggling with beyond sports for a couple of years now, but the live performances, the uh, Joni Mitchell, the Tracy Chapman, Billy Joel, U2, uh, Celine Dion surprise. Uh, and of course, you know, Taylor Swift, Jay-Z. I mean, they had, they had the royalty of music uh, there on Sunday night. There was something for everyone. Kind of like this podcast, Mosh. Yes, the producers of the Grammys approach it like we do at the Mo News Podcast. We try to give a wide variety of things to bring in the largest possible audience. Uh, but they put together a good show. It's the most fun award show really to watch. I know that we have the Oscars next month and the Oscars get a lot of to do. This really was a three-hour concert, which is always is a lot of fun. Oh, and the Miley Cyrus uh, first win was a, was a really uh, great moment as well. All right, our 90 seconds of Grammy talk is up. So we're going to get to the headlines. And then we will have more Grammy talk when we go through those numbers for. At the end. Yes. yes. All right, don't even bother voting on it. That is what House Republicans are telling their Senate colleagues when it comes to that new bill that clamps down on illegal immigration and sends aid to Ukraine and Israel. Buckingham Palace has announced that King Charles has cancer. What we know about his diagnosis. We'll have the latest from the West Coast as California gets pummeled by an atmospheric river, what that means. It's been one year since the East Palestine, Ohio train derailment and chemical spill. How the rail industry is now fighting any new safety laws. A category six hurricane. Some scientists say that climate change has them rethinking how powerful tropical cyclones may get around the world. Some new numbers out show that for the first time, more American kids are getting to school thanks to mom or dad, as opposed to that big yellow bus. Yeah, this story got a lot of attention on our Instagram account on Monday, uh, and so we'll share a bit of that. NASA says that they may have found another planet that could sustain human life. We'll tell you how far away it is. Yeah, Jill, we have a backup plan if we really (laughs) do some damage here to Earth, but uh, we'll tell you how many light years it is away. Well, after the Category 6 hurricane predictions, you never know. And it appears the all-star lineup on Sunday night helped to lead to a surge for Grammy's viewership. And Moshe has on this day in history. Jill, we actually have a, a royal headline related to King Charles's grandfather. That's an interesting on this day. And an important day for that iconic Olympic music that we're also used to. Do, 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 I do appreciate the preview, so thank you for that. We're going to try to bring a trumpet into the theme music here. <laughs> it really, it's like, you know, it's really energizing. All right, let's start with some politics here. Fewer than 24 hours after a long-awaited bipartisan border deal and foreign aid package was unveiled in the Senate late Sunday, opposition rapidly mounting. It makes it increasingly possible that this bill won't even survive a key vote expected later this week in the Senate. And even if it survives in the Senate, House Republicans say don't bother because it's going to die in their chamber. The bill would mark a tough change to the immigration law, which hasn't been modified for decades and would give the president far reaching powers to significantly restrict illegal migrant crossings at the southern border. But it doesn't appear to go far enough for former President Trump, House Speaker Mike Johnson, and other Republicans on the right. The $118 billion legislative package would also provide aid to key U.S. allies abroad, including billions of dollars to support Ukraine, security assistance for Israel, as well as humanitarian aid for civilians in Gaza and Ukraine. The bill is the product of months of bipartisan negotiations with a trio of senators, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, 
independent Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma, who is one of the chamber's most conservative Republicans. It takes only 41 senators voting against the bill to sink the deal in an upcoming vote, which could come as soon as tomorrow. And there are already 20 senators who have signaled publicly that they're opposed to it. 18 Republicans and two Democrats. For the Republicans, it doesn't go far enough. And for the two Democrats, it is too harsh towards migrants. More senators are expected to come out against the bill. And with so many lawmakers on both sides of the aisle lining up against it, the bill is at risk of not even getting the 60 votes needed to advance through the Senate. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it comes as former President Trump, House Speaker Mike Johnson have continued to attack the deal, really putting pressure on Senate Republicans again uh, to not even bother it uh, or face conservative, really putting pressure on Senate Republicans who may have been into supporting this face conservative backlash here. Keep in mind, James Lankford, the Oklahoma Republican senator who was part of this bipartisan deal, is very conservative, and yet he's being attacked from the right here. Uh, A reminder, Trump effectively opposing this deal for a variety of reasons, including the fact that immigration is a really effective issue for him on the campaign trail, chaos on the border, uh, being able to point the finger there at Biden, uh, he sees as helping him over the next 10 months win re-election. And so he doesn't want Republicans, his side, to give Biden a win in an election year, saying, wait for me next year, I'll give you an even better deal. Now, Langford says he's very, quote, confused by this criticism coming from Mike Johnson, other Republicans, saying he doesn't think they've even read the deal. He thinks there's a lot of misconceptions. He says he's going to have frank conversations with his Republican colleagues over the next couple of days. Though you've seen Chuck Schumer here, the Democrats, schedule a vote here very soon, very quickly. And so it's unclear whether there's enough time today and tomorrow ahead of a vote to get the support they need. A reminder, Langford says the deal includes expanded deportation flights building a border wall, expanded immigration and customs enforcement officers, more border patrol officers, detention beds, a faster process for deportation. And it also stops some loopholes when it comes to the asylum process. So this is effectively things that Republicans have been hoping to do for years that Democrats are now conceding on, that President Biden is conceding on because of just the incredible numbers they're seeing across the border right now. And yet you have Republicans saying, Mm, We need more here. Now, one of the misconceptions that Lankford is trying to clear up, and you may have seen this out there, including in tweets by the former president and the Speaker of the House, is the claim that this will let 5,000 illegals in a day before shutting down the border. Now, this deal does include a provision that would shut down the border if a 5,000 threshold is hit, but those are border encounters, not crossings, meaning these are people who come up to the border legally. No migrants trying to enter illegally would be allowed into the country. Uh, These are people who are trying to come in seeking asylum, saying, if I go back to my home country, Venezuela, Ecuador, you know, name the country, I will be killed or face dire consequences. Hence, asylum. And that's what Langford's trying to clear up here. Uh, There you have people on the right uh, saying we should allow in no asylum seekers, uh, even though international law and U.S. law right now uh, require us to take in asylum seekers. At the same time, you know, we're focusing on the people against this. Uh, Supporting this right now, interestingly, includes Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate. He has championed uh, the border. He says we're getting things here from Biden that we've never gotten for, for from Democrats. We should take this. This is better than nothing and will help us deal with the border this year. It's only February. We can't wait another year till Trump gets into office. We'll do more then. Uh, If he wins and Republicans are able to control all the chambers, he's actually warning that he thinks Democrats will make life difficult if they still control the Senate or somehow get control of the House and President Trump is elected. So take the deal while we have it. Remember, the deal also includes aid for Ukraine, aid for Israel, a whole variety of things they've packaged together. Many people have asked, why do they package this stuff together in Congress? Why not do stuff individually? Well, the reason is that will get all parties, depending on what you like, to vote for it. So even if there's something you don't like in it, if there's something you really like in it, that's why Congress has a tendency to create what they call Christmas tree packages, where everyone gets a present under the tree. And so you you want aid for Ukraine? It's in the package. You want aid for Israel? It's in the package. You want uh, more border policy? You want a more restrictive border policy? Guess what? Also in the package. Hence the $118 billion package here. So McConnell's into it. Interestingly, another group that came out in support of it, Jill, yesterday, the Border Patrol Union. Now, this is a group that has endorsed Trump in 2016 
and 2020, uh, very hardcore on the border. Despite Trump being against this, the National Border Patrol Council said, listen, there's a lot of good stuff in this. And while it's not perfect, this would help us really clamp down on the border. Please codify this uh, into law and it'll give us powers we've never had on the border before. I think the question is whether or not this is a gamble on the part of these Republicans voting against the bill. How will that play with Americans who say that the border is their top issue? And as you point out, the 2024 election is still months away. And if Trump were to win, he wouldn't take office until next January. Right. And we're seeing several hundred thousand people try to come across the border every month. So, uh, you know, the argument from Langford and Mitch McConnell is if we're serious about the border and we get a bunch of stuff in this, take the deal. And then again, if we uh, you know, are able to get uh, elected next year and have control of the White House, we'll do even more. The argument from the other side is don't give Biden the win and calm down the border uh, because it's a it's a potent political issue. And so uh, that's where things stand at the same time. Fifty seven percent of Americans, according to a new poll from Morning Council, so nearly six in 10 Americans say the border is a crisis. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays in particular with independents uh, and Democrats. Now, keep in mind some of the opposition to the bill coming from Democrats on the left uh, who feel that this is too harsh towards migrants. So they tried to find a compromise here and they have the right flank and some on the progressive flank who are not so happy here. Uh, but that's sort of the art of compromise, right? Uh, not You don't get everything you like, but you get some stuff you like. Uh, and so we'll see what the fallout is here and who's to blame and how the blame game works if this deal, which it looks like uh, it's going to Okay, now to some major news out of Buckingham Palace. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer and will suspend his public duties as he undergoes treatment. The palace making that announcement on Monday night, a week after the king, who was 75 years old, was discharged from a London hospital after a procedure to treat an enlarged prostate. The palace did not disclose what kind of cancer he has, but said that it was detected during that procedure. In a statement, the palace says during the king's recent hospital procedure for benign prostate enlargement, a separate issue of concern was noted. Subsequent diagnostic tests have identified a form of cancer. The king is grateful to his medical team for their swift intervention, which was made possible thanks to his recent procedure. He remains wholly positive about his treatment and looks forward to returning to full public duty as soon as possible. The king personally told both of his sons, Prince William and Harry, about his diagnosis. For everyone who is wondering, Prince Harry will be traveling from his home in California to the UK to see him in the next few days. Yeah, and that comes amid a, a difficult relationship, you can say, that he's had with both his brother and his father in the last couple of years. Uh, as far as the king here, his public appearances are canceled, though they do say that he will continue his constitutional role as the head of state, including dealing with paperwork and private meetings. A reminder of the way it works in England, as it has for a couple hundred years now, is the uh, royal, the monarch, handles honorary work, a head of state work, and the government is run by the prime minister. Prince William, who's been uh, helping his wife, uh, Princess Kate, as she recovered from abdominal surgery, will be taking on more of a role here, it appears. Again, we haven't gotten that many details here from Buckingham Palace, including, again, what type of cancer this is, what stage it's in, how long recovery and treatment may take. I imagine we might learn those details at some point. The palace was very clear and very open about the prostate issue. Uh, and uh, him heading to the hospital, hoping that that would then lead more people in the country to be inspired uh, by the king there. So we'll await details there. Though genetically, uh, the recent monarchs, including his parents, uh, have uh, enjoyed impressive longevity, Jill. Uh, his grandmother, the queen mother, lived till 101. His father, Prince Philip, died at 99. His mother, Queen Elizabeth, uh, lived till 96. In fact, her cause of death on her death certificate was old age. Uh, and he by comparison, is a is a young 75, uh, though he did have to spend more than 70 years as the heir apparent, finally at 73, getting to ascend to the throne two Septembers ago. And he's only been on the job for about a year and a half now. They do note that he's lived a very active life. He's a, he was a competitive polo player into his late 50s. He likes to take vigorous walks, they say, and he likes to trim his own hedges as a gardener, Jill. They let him do that? Yeah, you know, his dad was still driving, <laughs> right? Prince Philip was driving into his 90s, if you've seen. I'm, I'm referring to the hedges. 
Oh, the hedges. You know, listen, <laughs> I, while you're waiting to be king for 70 years, you got to keep yourself busy. On a more serious note, most of the analysts that I was listening to on Monday who obviously don't have the details of what kind of cancer he has, right. think that given that it was found during a procedure for something else, that it's probably in an early stage because he didn't have symptoms of the cancer. That's not what drove him to see a doctor. So they are assuming that it's it's still, again, uh, pretty early on. Which yeah. Is and given, given that his parents lived till basically 100, his grandmother lived till 100, and I would imagine as the king of England, you have pretty good medical care. Uh, checking up on things. Uh, that is in his favor. So we're hoping he has a uh, quick recovery. Uh, they also note that he believes in homeopathic and herbal remedies, uh, along with modern medicine, and that he avoids meat. He mainly eats fish, uh, is mainly vegetarian, uh, was never much of a smoker, though he does uh, like to enjoy a, a whiskey or a wine once in a while, Jill. So they do note that diet-wise, that uh, you know he's, he's, he's maintained pretty good care of himself and so they hope that all those factors uh, will help them with a uh, quick recovery here. Time now for the speed read from the L.A. Times. A deadly atmospheric river fueled storm caused chaos across California on Monday, battering the state with record amounts of rain, destructive mudslides and violent winds that left at least three people dead from falling trees. Nearly 38 million people are under flood alerts across the state and into Arizona including about 10 million people in Los Angeles County. At least three people have died because of the storm, all struck by trees that toppled over in the fierce weather. Officials warn dangers still lurk in the waters that could continue to rise. By Monday afternoon, the storm remained stalled out over the Los Angeles area, and forecasters warned that the unrelenting stream of rain, falling at roughly half an inch per hour, could re-intensify through the afternoon. The National Weather Service warned that the storm will continue to hammer the region throughout the day today. Yeah, I was getting videos from a number of you uh, of the L.A. River, the raging L.A. River. Typically, you see those concrete channels there across L.A. completely empty and dry. Uh, now they have turned into effectively raging rivers uh, and almost at capacity in certain areas. It's produced a massive amount of rain so far, especially for L.A. Some areas are already getting more than 10 inches, approaching a foot uh, on the UCLA campus. That's more than three times the average that falls for the entire month of February. The National Weather Service saying that Sunday was the third wettest day ever for February, going back to 1877, the 10th wettest day ever, and tied for the 10th wettest day ever uh, for the entire year. Streets in the hillside communities across L.A., turned into rushing rivers overnight, uh, a number of residents scrambling to evacuate, wind gusts knocked down power lines, nearly half a million were out of power. I know that that's gradually recovering. The governor has declared a state of emergency for LA, Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino, San Diego, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County. So basically all along uh, Southern California there. And this was the second in a week here. In some cases, you saw hurricane force winds. In some areas, Jill, seeing some of the gusts were above 150 miles per hour in some parts of the state. Moshe, I was watching one report where a redwood tree that had probably been standing for decades had simply collapsed onto a house. And, and as we were mentioning, that's the real danger for people um, in terms of deaths. That's unfortunately what we're seeing in terms of people who lost their lives. Okay, from the Washington Post, nearly a year after a Norfolk Southern freight train derailed near East Palestine, Ohio, releasing toxic chemicals into the air and soil, the rail operator's top executive returned to the scene of the accident and reiterated his promise of change. That CEO, Alan Shaw, said, quote, I want a response from Norfolk Southern that we can look back five years from now, 10 years from now, and we can be proud. However, a different story in the nation's capital where Norfolk Southern has sounded a bit more defiant. It has joined some of the nation's leading freight railroads in a bid to weaken newly proposed safety legislation, threatening to leave millions of Americans around the country at risk of deadly derailments and dangerous chemical spills. They're lobbying against a bipartisan proposal from Ohio's two senators, Sherrod Brown, who's a Democrat, and J.D. Vance, a Republican, unveiled last spring as a direct response to that accident in East Palestine. The Railway Safety Act aims to toughen rail inspections, improve derailment detection technology, and ensure greater safeguards for hazardous materials. Again, publicly, the company and its peers have pledged to work with lawmakers on the bill, but behind the scenes, they have pushed to severely weaken or eliminate some of its core provisions. 
Senator Brown saying, quote, for 150 years, the rail industry has been one of the most powerful industries in the country. They have spent tens of millions of dollars lobbying. It is what they do. They are very good at it. We forgot how powerful they are. And then Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg saying in a recent interview, they will often say the right things, but then through their actions and especially through their lobbying, move in a different direction. Yeah, so over the past year, the five largest rail operators, that includes Norfolk Southern, spent roughly $17 million to lobby lawmakers while donating generously to key members of Congress who oversee transportation issues. That's sort of how things work in Washington. So in doing so, rail industry lobbyists have been fighting the Biden administration on even some basic upgrades. That includes efforts to ensure engineers have special breathing equipment on board uh, and also includes new rules that would require some of these trains that are miles long to be staffed by more than one person. So all this opposition by them has bogged down federal action and has left Congress unable to hold a single vote on rail safety legislation so far in the House. When they asked Norfolk Southern about this, they have declined to be interviewed about what has been happening in Washington. The company says, though, leave it up to them. They've already altered their practices since the accident, improving crash detection, training first responders, supplying them with more information about the freight train's contents. That's been something that was at issue with East Palestine, not knowing exactly what was uh, aboard that train in every single compartment. Now, some companies are participating in new safety measures. Others are not. Effectively, the country split between a few of them. If you look at a map, they all control various parts of the country when it comes to uh, industrial transportation. And this is indicative of, you know, a lot of things we see in Congress when it comes to dealing with issues after the fact is you see the sense of urgency right away after something happens. But lobbyists know if they can bog things down long enough, that urgency goes away. But there's still a lot uh, that we still don't know about the impact of that spill in East Palestine. We did tell you last week the president is set to go finally for the first time uh, to mark a year there at some point this month. So we'll continue to stay on top of that uh, and the larger safety issues related to these accidents. Also from The Washington Post, a look at the disappearing school bus. For the first time on record, most American students are now being driven to school and back in a private vehicle. 53% of U.S. students get dropped off at school or drive themselves, according to the Post's analysis of the recently revamped National Household Travel Survey. It comes out of the Federal Highway Administration. So the pandemic appears to have accelerated what was already a trend away from the bus and towards mom or dad taking the kids to school. 33% of kids take the school bus, 10% bike or go by foot, and 2% take public transportation. Back in the 60s, the majority walked or biked to school, but that was also a time when schools were built more conveniently to districts, and now they're built a bit further away. Yeah, there's a zoning issue there as well, but it was an interesting trend line, and we posted a couple slides over on the Instagram account yesterday. They got a lot of reaction. So effectively, before 1970, the majority of kids uh, walked or biked to school, even if it was a couple miles away. Then through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, school bus was the number one way to get to school. And then if you look at the numbers, about 2000, in the early 2000s, when it, it, you started to see this elevation of people driving their kids to school, and then most recently now, that is a significant majority as uh, buses have dropped. And it's really got my attention, Jill. I was somebody who took a bus to school starting uh, in uh, first grade through getting my driver's license in high school, uh, spent I can't even imagine an ungodly amount of hours of my life aboard that school bus. So it was interesting to see these numbers and the decline here. And we did hear from a number of you uh, for a variety of reasons, several of you saying that school bus shortages, driver shortages have uh, really led to a situation now where there's these uh, crazy long routes that buses are inconsistent, that in some cases your kids were getting to school late or home very late, uh, or even calling from school being like, the bus isn't here. That So that inconsistency has led many of you to have to uh, become transportation for your kids to school. Some schools no longer offering buses at, or some charging now uh, if you want uh, your children to be able to take the bus. Of course, there's also safety issues. Uh, and in some cases, they have uh, brought kids together where, where the same bus is taking kindergartners through high schoolers together which leads to its own issues uh, that parents fear here. A bus with kindergartners through high school kids uh, yeah. would not fly in my house anyway. Right. I, I was hearing someone. It, yeah, I heard about some very concerning incidents, Jill, where, you know, when you have a 
you know, 16 year olds uh, taking the bus with five and seven year olds to school, uh, it can lead to some really terrible uh, consequences. And so, you know, there's a lot of issues here. And some parents are saying, I wish there were uh, buses that were reliable here because because I don't want to have to use so much time of my day taking my kids back and forth and shuttling them back and forth here. Uh, They did find an interesting split in the data here that shows that kids whose parents have four-year degrees, have college degrees and more white-collar jobs uh, are being driven to school, whereas kids whose parents don't have college degrees are still having to take the bus, uh, even through the inconsistency here, even with the delays, etc. They did break out the data by state, if you're curious. Three of the states with the highest number of students still taking the bus Mississippi, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, all 85 to 90 percent of kids still taking the bus. Three states with the lowest amount of kids taking the bus, Texas, California and Nebraska, about one in five kids in those states still taking the bus. Most looking back at my childhood, I feel like riding the school bus is kind of like a rite of passage in yeah. a way. So I feel bad for kids. Not that going with your parents is so bad, but it's just one of those experiences that that's kind of part of school. That said, My daughter loves going on the bus. She's in kindergarten. Of course, I've mentioned before, she's with her older cousin and some friends. Uh, But I do feel lucky having read some of those comments that people wrote into the Mo News account uh, just about, you know, the shortage of bus drivers and how difficult it is in some areas to have a a reliable bus route and and what people are going through. So, so definitely this bus driver shortage having a real impact for parents. Yeah. It's, it's really changing the dynamic here. And there's also just a larger issue of trust, right? uh, These days as well, though, like you, I have a fond experience despite, you know, uh, remembering that, you know, some of the bullying I faced on the bus or, you know, this is the first place where I encountered like, people trying to sell me drugs. You know, you it is a rite of passage, right? <laughs> On the bus, when I think back yeah. of, of going through that, like standing out there in Chicago winter and like negative 20 weather, back then they didn't cancel school for negative 20 and waiting for the bus. <laughs> I can You'll tell have my, good stories for baby O. Right, I can tell my kid one day, like, don't <laughs> complain. Let me tell you what your father had to deal with back in the day. Moj, now they're going to be pushing skincare on kids on the bus. <laughs> Have you tried this moisturizer? <laughs> Try this moisturizer, kid. All right, from USA Today, some new research into hurricanes and climate change. When meteorologists first started to use the five-category Saffir-Simpson scale to measure hurricane intensity back in the 1970s, a Category 5 storm represented oblivion. Those hurricanes with sustained winds of at least 157 miles per hour could flatten any structure of the era, so there was no reason to give the most ferocious tier of hurricanes as an upper bound and create anything more. However, as the planet warms, storms are increasingly surpassing what was once considered extreme. This is according to research published Monday. Now, two scientists are saying some storms could merit a new label that they say a growing number of storms already merit, Category 6. Climate scientists Michael Winner and Jim Cosson suggest that the Category 6 label could go to any tropical cyclone with sustained winds of at least 192 miles per hour, an intensity that five storms have surpassed since 2013. Meteorologists have for years debated whether the current hurricane scale adequately captures the hazards of today's storms. It only takes winds into account, not pounding waves or flooding, and whether a new top-end category is needed. Yeah, there's a larger discussion here happening that even if you added that category six, it again only accounts for winds, and there's all these other uh, factors that go into storms. As we've covered, storm surge, the amount of rainfall, tornadoes, and rip currents uh, that are caused here. As for this hypothetical category six with a minimum threshold of 192, so again, cat five begins at 157. This would create cat six at 192 or above. You mentioned five storms in the modern era, which would have merited the Cat 6. One of those hit Mexico. The rest have hit the Philippines and East Asia, uh, have been tropical, have been typhoons out there. What they found in this study is that the chances of that potential intensity of 192 or above, the odds now have more than doubled since 1979. The growing areas where we could see more of these storms in the coming years, the Gulf of Mexico, the Philippines, and parts of Southeast Asia and Australia. 
among the factors here, increasing temperatures and the increasing temperature of water that really could fuel these storms. There is no sign, though, that the government hurricane forecasters will adopt a Category 6 anytime soon. It would require a lot of debate and discussion here. But again, they are having a larger discussion about better ways to frame storms beyond just category two, three, four, five, which again, it's just the wind, but also talk about the storm surge, the rainfall, the tornadoes, et cetera. Uh, Jill, a while back, we did a deep dive on the, over on the Mo News Premium Instagram account, where we actually went into the history of naming storms, uh, because of course, they're called different things depending on where they form. In the Atlantic, we call them hurricanes. In the Eastern Pacific, uh, we also call them hurricanes. But then out in the Western Pacific, East Asia, they're called typhoons. And then in the Indian Ocean, they're called cyclones. All the same thing, all with different names. And we did a deep dive on that over on the Mo News Premium account. So join that and check that out over on Insta. All right, all this talk about devastating storms from ABC News. NASA appears to have found a potential backup Earth that could be conducive to human life in case we totally destroy this planet. The bad news is that it is located 137 light years away. But the question remains, could a recently discovered super Earth have the potential temperature and conditions to sustain life? Due to the super Earth's distance from its parent star, it could be in a conservative, it could be in a conservative habitable zone and harbor the right temperature for liquid water to form on its surface, which is essential to sustain life. This is according to the agency, which also added that, quote, several other factors would have to line up, of course. Astronomers say the planet, dubbed TOI 715 lowercase b, is about one and a half times the width of Earth and orbits a small reddish star. Mosh, not the most fun name. No, if we're going to end up sending anyone there, which again, we'll get to in a second, we definitely need to rename it from TOI 715B. I like Super Earth. I think that sounds great. I'd go to that. The same system also could harbor a second Earth-sized planet, NASA says that if confirmed, it would become the smallest planet where people could potentially live, which was discovered by TESS, which is a satellite. Yeah, we have a specific satellite that's looking way out there for other systems. Just keep in mind here, the solar system, our solar system is located in the Milky Way galaxy. And we just are one star of billions of stars in the Milky Way. Each of those stars, each of those stars, like the sun, could have their own solar system with them. So literally there are trillions of planets outside our solar system, but located in the Milky Way galaxy uh, that could be good for life. We've only been able to observe a couple thousand of those trillions of planets. As for the distance of TOI 715B, Jill, you mentioned it was 137 light years away. For context, with modern technology, it takes about 20,000 years to go one light year. So it would take about 2 million years using our current technology to get to this planet 137 light years away. So so not us, not the grandkids, not the great grandkids. <laughs> 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 it, would, it would take a while unless we really come up with some new technology to, to get us to TOI 715B. Uh, well, this has been a fun theoretical exercise anyway. The bottom line, if you take away anything from this story, let's protect this planet because this one's way too far away. And finally, from Variety, it looks like Sunday's Grammys actually found a way to grow live viewership for once at a time when it is so hard to get Americans to watch any live TV except for sports. The show brought in about 17 million viewers with a show featuring several high profile performances and surprises. And this marks a 34 percent improvement from last year's show, which reached 12.4 million viewers on average and makes it the most watched Grammys since 2020. These numbers count traditional TV, cable and streaming. They peaked at the 9.45 p.m. Eastern section. That's when Stevie Wonder, Annie Lennox, John Batiste led the In Memoriam segment. Uh, more than 18 million people watched that. Then, as we mentioned earlier in the pod, you had U2, Billy Joel, Celine Dion. Uh, Celine Dion make her cameo to present an award for Taylor Swift. Mariah Carey. Uh, you also had Tracy Chapman in her performance with Luke Combs. Uh, Joni Mitchell. So really an all-star show on Sunday night. And then, of course, Taylor Swift, while winning one award, announcing yet another album. Uh, pretty remarkable. This one, the Tortured Poets Department. Jill, she put out the uh, cover there. Pretty salacious cover. Especially for Taylor Swift, who doesn't usually 
take that angle. It does feel like, though, the Grammy producers finally realized that it's not the young people who are going to watch the Grammys. They they don't have TVs. They're not watching. They're just going to get the clips on TikTok. Yep. So they did decide to at least have some performances that cater to a little bit of an older generation. You saw with Billy Joel, Joni Mitchell, some of the people, Tr- Tracy Chapman, not even the boomers, even, you know, even elder millennials like us and Gen Xers, dare I say we – DVR'd it in my house, my husband and I, and watched it this morning, which I think makes us like if, really. If you old ever and- use it, if you ever use a DVR, <laughs> that is who uh, live TV has to go for. <laughs> but anyway, at least they find. Is that an embarrassing thing to admit no, that we no, did that? <laughs> no, no. The only, the only, the, the only thing I'm surprised you didn't mention is that you didn't TiVo it because I feel like TiVo was such a thing. <laughs> like I, I still have friends who, 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 who use the word TiVo as a verb. I did a very unofficial poll on my Instagram page asking people what their favorite Grammy performance was, and by far it was the Tracy Chapman Luke Combs. Well, Jill, your demographic is the DVR TiVo demographic, so <laughs> so that tracks. <laughs> All right, now time for On This Day in History. We begin on this day in 1933. The 20th Amendment to the Constitution was put into effect, the so-called lame duck amendment that moved up Inauguration Day from March to January. Until then, uh, there was an election in November and the new president wasn't sworn in till March. This moved it up till January 20th, taking into account that they didn't have to get to D.C. by horseback anymore. And so uh, ultimately here, this also tightened the amount of time an outgoing president had to do nothing or mess around, as we've seen in recent years. So they moved it up till January 20th, where Inauguration Day still is. All right, this is notable given the King Charles news we told you about earlier. On this day in 1952, King George VI died in his sleep. Princess Elizabeth, his daughter, succeeded him. She was in Kenya at the time. You probably, you may have seen this depicted in The Crown. She was crowned Queen Elizabeth II, but on this day, effectively, King Charles' grandfather passed away. Uh, Of course, he ascended to the throne after his older brother, King Edward VIII, abdicated because he was set to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. So a lot of controversy back then, but a notable day in uh, UK monarchy history. And another day, another Michael Jordan headline. On this day in 1988, Michael Jordan made his signature slam dunk from the free throw line during the NBA slam dunk contest. That inspired the Air Jordan Jumpman logo. You know the Air Jordan logo? That is based on what happened on this day in 1988. On this day in 1968, Bugler's Dream, written just a few years earlier by Leo Arnaud, became the official theme of the Winter Olympic coverage that year when it was airing on ABC. The iconic sound would be incorporated effectively into every Olympic theme through history. John Williams, the composer, incorporated into his theme that now is used by NBC. And uh, Leo Arnaud, the composer of Bugler's Dream, uh, essentially lifted it from a trumpet's call dating back to Napoleon, a cavalry call. So this goes back a couple centuries in France. And finally, an iconic song of the 90s, Montel Jordan released This Is How We Do It 29 years ago today, Jill. If only it was Friday night, Mosh. <laughs> this is how we do it. <laughs> it's Friday night. <laughs> we should make that our Friday uh, podcast theme music. All right, three more days to go till Friday. We want to thank everyone for listening to the Mo News Podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and review us in the App Store. We got some incredible reviews in the last couple of days, so appreciate those of you taking a moment to review us uh, on Apple uh, and on Spotify. So if you can take a moment, that is